What's up? My name is Marquan Smith. I'm an actor, creator, executive producer of a TV series called The Godfather of Harlem that's on Epics right now. Give us a kind of step-by-step -step of how did all this come about, where you from, how you grew up, Let's get a sense of that. Well, my mom's is from uh, South America. She's from Guyana, and I was raised in Harlem on 128th and St. Nicholas. Mm -hmm. And from there, I moved out to Far Rockaway, Queens, about 12, 13 years old. And moving out to Far Rockaway, if anybody knows about Far Rockaway, the last stop on the A is just like if you fall asleep, you asked out. Pretty you much. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Ain't no pretty much you are asked out. Because <laughs> you got to take that round that round robin all the way back to the Bronx. Right, But right. Far Rockaway, you know, was fun. You know, we had the beaches. We had, uh, you know, that was the only thing that I can remember really what we could do, play basketball, the beaches. But it was also, you know, a lot of uh, poverty around this. It was uh, low-income housing. Was you always into filming when you was in your younger days? Or was that something that came about later? Now, actually, you know, Watching movies is what really kept me out of trouble. Mm -hmm. While everybody was watching like Break In and Crush Groove and things of kids of my age, caliber movies they would watch, I was watching like Casablanca mm -hmm. and uh, Rebel Without a Cause and Down These Mean Streets and Raging Bull and uh, things of that sort. Mm -hmm. You know, I started to kind of like realize what directors were who, like Sergio Leone. Like once, one of my favorite movies is uh, Once Upon a Time in America. And then, you know, I would see Guy Ritchie and Ron Howard, that, that combination of producer-director. Mm -hmm. After high school, um, did you get into um, any kind of filming or anything when you was in college? What college did you go to? Actually, after high school, I got on a road. You know, okay. I um, got on a road with an individual, you know, my older brother, call him that to this day, Father MC. Mm -hmm. He got a record deal with Uptown. MCA Records. It was really Uptown Records with George Harrell. And I remember back in the days, we used to hop on the train to go to the New Music Seminar. That mm -hmm. was, if anybody knows about the New Music Seminar, that was a place to be to get your demos heard. Mm -hmm. So me and father, we used to get our little uh, Chinese food, like our, you know, the, 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 the red sauce, the Chinese you know, right, red, the rice cup, rice, the rice cup, cups. Yeah. We would mm -hmm. take our rice cups, be on the train. Mm -hmm. Father used to have a 40, I used to have a 40, and you know, he really kept me enthused and he showed me when he got his record deal and took me around the world. Like he really stopped me because I was I was going down a bad path. I was in Sparford, I was in Lincoln Hall, I was all in these DFY facilities and he, he was like, you know what, you know, you're running with the wrong crowd. You know, I wanna show you a different, a different light. I became a roadie. Mm -hmm. So now if anybody wants to know what a roadie was, I did the grunt work, like the coffins or the 1200s, I'm the one that carried them. I had to make sure that that tape was secure. Mm -hmm. But during that time, you know, I, I aligned myself with uh, a good friend of mine at the time was Tupac Shakur because he was a roadie for um, Digital Underground. Right. And then Tretch was a roadie for Latifah. Nice. So um, from the road, then, if you was into the music business, how did you transfer over into film and doing the stuff that you do? I believe like as, as an artist, you're a creator. You shouldn't be limited to one thing. Absolutely. So you had to transition, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all in the same hand, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Film, television, it's just creative. Mm-hmm. What were some of the first things that you did as far as for television was concerned and movies was concerned? Well, like, uh, after, the, after the American Dream popped and it turned into the American Nightmare when Father lost his deal mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> we all had to like figure out what was our next move, you know? Mm -hmm. So fast forward, um, I started working at uh, BET and um, I didn't gel with the corporate world like that. Mm -hmm. I just felt that I was being disengaged. Like I knew that my roof had a ceiling there. Mm -hmm. So I sat there and I sat there. I was always creating projects, but I just felt that, you know, I wasn't getting the right opportunities and the right deals or anything at BET. Not to bash BET, but it was just, wasn't just for me. Mm -hmm. So my 16th year, you know, Viacom already merged and took over BET in 2001. The 16th year, Viacom really took over BET mm -hmm. when it was no more black folks. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was like, yeah. no more BET Finance, Viacom Finance, no more BET HR, mm -hmm. uh, Viacom HR. And uh, it started getting slimmer and slimmer until I got a call to go into the conference room for a, a allegedly crew meeting. Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh, thank you for your time oh. and you being here. Mm -hmm. We got to let you go. Mm -hmm. And for 16 years, they gave me $4,000 in severance. And I was like, wow. Whoa. That's that was like a, a a blow to death. That was like the ow, the Bruce Lee shit. You know what I'm saying? And um, so I had to figure it out real fast. So then, um, what was the next step after? Well, the, well, the next step was this. Um, let's 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 rewind back to 2000. Okay. I used to go to Lennox Terrace in Harlem 
And um, there was a lady by the name of Margaret Johnson, who was like my godmother. Now, if anybody out there watched Godfather Harlem, Margaret is played by an excellent actress. Her name is Demi Singleton, but she's playing my godmother, Margaret Johnson. Mm -hmm. And Margaret used to tell me these magical stories about walking in Harlem in 1963 and smelling fresh laundry hanging out a tenement window, mm -hmm. or hearing Sam Cooke's voice coming out of a transistor radio, mm -hmm. or even walking past 125th Street and seeing James Brown name on the marquee, mm -hmm. or driving past Sugar Ray Robinson's barbershop and Nack and Cola getting the shape up. So all these magical stories she told me, I used to listen to, but she also used to tell me about her grandfather slash dad, Ellsworth Raymond Johnson, who migrated up here from uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the streets knows him as Bumpy Johnson. Mm -hmm. But Bumpy was more than just a gangster. He read uh, Shakespeare, he read Nietzsche. He was the first African-American uh, person that was able to sit down with the mob. He was born in 1905, October 31st on Halloween. But think about it, the first person that was able to sit down with Lucky Luciano, mm -hmm. Frank Costello, Vito Genovese, mm -hmm. Bugsy Siegel, they all came up together. How did that project get off the ground? Like, what was the legwork? Man, it was it was a lot of legwork. Leg I met my partner, Jim Atchison, and I, um, I pitched the story to him, and he was like, yeah, I know who Bumpy Johnson is. I'm just a white boy from Boston, but I know who he is. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, then I met uh, somebody else that was an agent named Jay Cohen. And he was like, yeah, we know who Bumpy is, right? But everybody knew who Bumpy was, but I didn't, I didn't know them personally. Right. I'm just talking to him on the phone. Mm -hmm. He called me back one day. He was like, how would you feel about Forrest playing Bumpy? I looked at him and hung up the phone. It's like, who the f***? You know, I don't believe s***. Right. You know, I'm from Far mm -hmm. Rockway. You know, you could, yeah, whatever. You hear a million stories hear a million all stories. the time. Yeah. It's a million stories in this city. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So um, he called me back. He's like, yeah, because... Um, I believe that he'll be a, a great Bumpy Johnson. So fast forward, I spoke to Forrest. Um, Joanne Colano, who's my, my, my business partner's uh, wife who manages Forrest, was like, this is a great story. This story needs to be told. Mm -hmm. They came out here on Christmas. I brought them up to meet Margaret. Mm -hmm. Margaret Cosign was like, these are the individuals I want you to help tell my story. I had three white folks in Lennox Terrace listening to Margaret, and Margaret is mean as f mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? She's nice if she, she likes you, but she can get real mean mm -hmm. and, 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 and spicy. Mm -hmm. So I had him up there, and you know, her house is like a museum. Yeah. It's not, it, it felt like the 60s. Mm -hmm. And she was telling us the same robust stories she told me. Mm -hmm. She was talking about how Malcolm X used to come over the house every Sunday mm -hmm. and play chess with Bumpy. Mm -hmm. And um, Urban legend is Bumpy beat Bobby Fisher in chess. Mm -hmm. You know, so she used to tell us these magical, magical stories in her living room. Mm -hmm. And um, I took uh, Jim to Sylvia as we sat down. He said, yo, we gotta get this story done. And then I did a lot of the grunt work myself and this guy by the name of Tony Gentry who helped me. I went to the Schomburg Museum and I just started building and building and building and building for almost a year. I was just grabbing material, microfilm, like. You would have thought that I, I worked at the Schomburg, how long I was there just getting as much material as possible because there was no material out there. Mm -hmm. And when I got the material, you know, I had to find a writer. Mm -hmm. So looking through my IMDB, I'm looking to see who could be a good writer for this project. I saw Chris Brancato and Paul Eckstein. And I called my uh, producing partner, Jim. I said, Jim, you know Chris Brancato? He's like, yeah, he lives right across the street from me. He comes over to my house for um, Sunday dinner for Italian food all the time. That's you know? what you call fake and right I was there. Like, That's what that Get is. Out of here. Mm -hmm. But at the time, Chris was committed to doing another project. It was called Las Serenas, and it was on CBS. Mm -hmm. And he was waiting to see if that got picked up, as well as um, the El Chapo um, project he worked on after, um, after Narcos. Mm -hmm. And so he couldn't commit to us. But Paul, who's a great brother, he said, you know what, he'll fly out here and meet me. We had a conversation and he was like, yeah, I wanna do this. And on top of that, Bumpy put Paul's grandmother through college. Mm. Wow. As well as Chris and Bumpy did the original movie, Hoodlum. Mm. So they knew the lay of the land. Mm -hmm. So after 11 or 12 scripts, cause Bumpy already, I mean, I, I call Forrest Bumpy, but mm -hmm. Forrest already committed to becoming a producer after 11 or 12 scripts from the from the studio and me getting my deal with ABC Signature through Tracy Underwood. They said, uh, Forrest said, you know what? I want to play Bumpy. Mm -hmm. And then the magic happens. Uh, William Morris committed to representing the project. 
Um, had a great other producer, Forrest's producing partner, Nina Yang Bon Jovi, who's really, uh, really proactive out here working on diversity and, and making sure people of color, uh, our stories are told the right way. And we took it out. We got turned down by three networks. Mm -hmm. I was in a deep, dark funk, like, this has to win because I don't. I never believed in a plan B. Mm -hmm. I think when you have a plan B, you plan in the fail. That's right. how I always looked at it. Mm -hmm. I just like you know I prayed on it. I was like, man, I just hope there's somebody that believes in this project as much as I believe in it because the script is good. Mm -hmm. Everybody that read the script said it was amazing, mm -hmm. and it was pr one person by the name of Michael Wright over at Epics. He came from working at uh, TNT and Steven Spielberg's company, Amblin Entertainment, and. He read the script, he was like, yo, this is amazing. I need you guys to come in right now. And he also said, you know, what was told to me, cause I wasn't in the meeting, I was in, a, I was in New York in a funk uh, and I had my phone in the car and Forrest called me like six times. He's like, why are you not picking up your phone? Why are you not picking up your phone? I picked up my phone, he was like, hey, we just sold it in the room. Are you ready to play, uh, are you ready to play your role? Mm. And it was just like, it was like so surreal. I went upstairs. I, DDT, my mother like, oh, man. <laughs> she just told me a little while ago, like, you, maybe you and your brother need to try something else. I said, mm -hmm. nah, Ma, I don't have a plan B. I never did. And mm -hmm. um, it was just amazing, you know, then we had to go through the politics of closing out our deal. But we, we have a company that really believes in us, which is Epics. You know, the marketing behind this, the, um, just the beauty of the story and my journey itself you know, means a lot. Mm -hmm. Anything else you got, you working on that you got? Oh yeah, man, I'm, I'm excited, man. Like, you know, I'm presently uh, working on the Larry Davis story. Oh wow. Larry Davis was a young man in the Bronx in the 80s that was forced to sell drugs in 1989, November 19th. Mm -hmm. Cops came to his home to assassinate him because he didn't want to sell any drugs anymore and um, tried to kill him. He was on the run for 17 days. He shot back, he defended himself. Uh, when the police went to the hospitals and they, they checked their, their blood work, they found out they were high on alcohol and they had traces of cocaine. That's a story that's really relevant that I'm, I'm, I'm about to tell. I'm also about to tell Sly and the Family Stone, a wonderful group out the 60s, pre-Vietnam, post-Vietnam, you know, um, civil rights, Black Panther, you know. Mm -hmm. um, any um, advice you give to anybody trying to get into the business or people that's in the business, if they're struggling trying to move forward, you have any words I tell, I tell them this, man, don't look at my breakthrough, but look what I've been through, mm -hmm. you know? So many people want success, but they're not ready to eat ramen noodles. Mm -hmm. They're not ready to sleep on somebody's couch when they can't afford hotel tonight. Mm -hmm. They're not ready to admit that they gotta buy a buddy pass, knowing that they're trying to get on this plane Sunday to be able to get to this meeting at Netflix on Monday at a certain time. Right. You feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If you're not ready for that, you don't want success. And that's what I what I, what I I went through. Mm -hmm. my, my, my process, my steps, I had to build a package. It wasn't overnight, you know? Mm -hmm. I can't tell you the template of how to be successful, but I can tell you this, the only way you're gonna do it is to believe in yourself. You can either chase your pension or chase your passion. Mm -hmm. That's up to you. Mm-hmm. Oh, dope. All right, cool, that's it.